It's my pleasure today to introduce our colleague, Professor Tom Murphy. Um, and I, I have to say that Tom has quite a quite an interesting portfolio of things he's worked on. I have had many uh, conversations with, with Tom and 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 his graduate students on on uh, uh, lunar laser ranging. And you may know about the Apollo experiment. You could get the uh, you know, the distance to the moon to a millimeter precision, so that we could, in principle, know the trajectory of the moon through space time to a precision of order one millimeter. And if we had a prediction from general relativity about what the trajectory of these planets could be, that could be an incredibly good test of general relativity. In fact, it already is. So, and you may know about general relativity that it's a kind of a, it's a local theory, it relates space time curvature locally to the local mass energy content. There's another part of that theory, though, that is really kind of unspecified. So general relativity doesn't really say much about the overall topology, for example, of the universe. I don't that issue. And that's one thing Tom and his graduate students have thought about quite a bit. And I've talked to them about this as well. So Dan Gonzalez, one of Tom's graduate students, has just won this very prestigious uh, graduate student teaching award. Stand up. Uh, <laughs> So in getting the uh, precision, the, the distance to the moon to precision accuracy with lunar laser ranging, think about that. So for me as a theorist, that, that seems utterly daunting because you'd have to worry about, you know, tides raised in the rocks of the earth and on the moon and the, the vagaries of the earth's atmosphere and on and on and on. So you have to know a lot of physics and be able to back out that physics in order to actually get the distance. So it's not surprising that Tom is an expert in doing that. And so he's an outstanding expert at estimating things. So Tom has challenged many of us. If you drop it, drop it, it shatters into pieces. How many pieces does it shatter into? So it's not surprising that he's not afraid to take on big things and, and, and huge problems. And so you're about to hear how he's taken on perhaps the biggest problem that we may face. And there's a trigger warning here. Because he's going to tell you that one of the planets in that in, in this in this first slide here is in trouble. <laughs> Great, thanks, George. Okay. So this was a difficult talk for me to assemble because I'm packing in a few decades of exploration into you know 50 minutes or something, and I'm going to. You know, I, I prioritized big picture and conclusions over all the details that I had to go through to get to the point where I made those conclusions. So it might seem like the scaffolding isn't quite there. And I apologize for that. There's only so much I can do in this uh, in this format. So um, let's start the. OK, so. Um, George talked to you a little bit about who I am, a, a background in astronomical instrumentation, building things for telescopes. I've always found that to be fun and challenging. Looked at colliding galaxies as a graduate student working at Palomar in the infrared. And then George told you about the test of general relativity using uh, laser ranging. Here's a picture of our laser beam going to an eclipse moon. You can't take a picture like this in the illuminated moon uh, because it's, it saturates. Um, and in the process, co-invented an airplane detector with Bill Coles, who's here, and Alan is here, and Mike, and uh, in the electronic shop. So uh, that was a fun project. So very kind of technology-based. Um, but in parallel, in 2004, my first year at UCSD, spring of 2004, I taught a course called um, Physics 12, Energy and the Environment. And it sort of changed my direction because uh, I, I went in thinking that I was going to learn what our brilliant energy future is going to look like and figure it all out and use my estimation skills to understand how much would be solar and wind and whatever else. Um, but the deeper I went into it, the more difficult it became because it was, or the more difficult I realized it was going to be. And it sort of set up a dual life for myself um, of doing my uh, astrophysics career, but also worried a lot about what's going to happen as we encounter planetary limits. Uh, so I was asking, what, what is this all about? Where are we going? Uh, what, is it, what does it matter? So um, 
I'm going to talk about space. I'm going to give you some perspectives in, in the sense of space and time and energy and ecology. And space is really almost empty. This is a fairly accurate depiction. Um, there's a three, a three down in the corner of space. Um, but besides that, it's pretty empty. We often see representations that look like this. And that's just really uh, far from the mark. Not even the planets aren't even scaled relative to themselves the right way, and the distances are completely impossibly. Uh, uh, but I mean, you probably know that right? it's not packed like this. Uh, but you can't represent graphically, either in pixels or in ink, something that's really uh, true to the scale. Um, you'd have to have Earth, or the scale here would have to be about um, 300,000 times the Earth diameter. So in this room, you know, basically 50 kilometers for the scale of uh, Sun to Neptune here. So um, a real quick kind of run through a mental model that you can carry around for the scales of space. So if you make the sun one millimeter, a grain of sand, then it's really hot, by the way, don't touch it. Um, and it's 200 watts and it's about the same output as uh, 12 100 watt light bulbs just in that one sand grain. Um, and it contains almost all the mass of the solar system. The solar system itself is about the size of a bedroom. Jupiter is about the size of a human hair. So a speck, hard to even see. And it's about half a meter away from the sand grain and contains almost all the remaining mass. Um, Earth itself is like a bacterium. And so it's a pretty empty place. And every time now when I clean off my laptop screen, wipe off the dust, there's still more dust on my laptop screen than this solar bedroom sized solar system contains in the form of planets. Um, so think about that when you clean your screen. All right, the farthest we travel on this scale is just a quarter of a millimeter from the Earth, uh, humans. And that was 50 years ago. We haven't been that far for 50 years. And since then, it's just a micron away. So really skimming the surface of this microbe. Mars, meanwhile, is 600 times farther than the moon. So it's three orders of magnitude, roughly a bigger step. Um, and this step is hard. The moon is hard. The next star in the scale, it's another sand grain 30 kilometers away, a full day's walk. And so space is incredibly empty. And that's in a rich, dense galaxy. OK, so uh, why do I even go through this? Well, because people talk about colonization. And I would have an easier time believing this fantasy of colonization if we had demonstrated a self-sustained biosphere here on Earth. We can't make an artificial biosphere. It's very complicated. Um, in fact, we're destroying the one biosphere that we have, the actual biosphere. Um, so that's what we can do. Um, the space station imports most of its oxygen. It recycles some of it, but it's very dependent on a tether to the Earth. That's pretty important to realize. It'd be easier to believe colonization if we'd colonized Mount Everest or the ocean floors and had condominiums there, but we don't and we won't. Those are far easier to get to, get supplies, rescue. Um, uh, you can find nearby food um, on the ocean floor. You've got things swimming around, scuttling around. So that's just not true of space. There's nothing to eat there. Um, so if you look at planetary atmospheres in the solar system, they're really just four, and they're quite different in terms of temperature and pressure. I surrounded the Earth with a blue bar that's approximately our comfort zone. Uh, it'd have to be pure oxygen down here at the bottom. Mount Everest is just outside of that, but an absolute heaven compared to any of these other places. It's also true that radiation we're protected from by the Earth's magnetosphere. And it's about 100 times higher outside the Earth's magnetosphere. So to be on any of these other planets would require basically living in caves. And that's just kind of amusing to picture a man in a spacesuit, but that's what it would be. And so I'm kind of tired of these. Uh, you know, cute, but completely, in, you know, inane ideas, um, kind of juvenile, they're fun to think about, but, but uh, not where we're going. Okay, so let's talk about energy um, and some ecology. So this is a, a graph that I think is incredibly important to understand. 
This is thousands of years of energy use of the human endeavor. And it's invisible at zero for almost all of this time. And then when it rises up in recent years, that is a story of fossil fuels. That's what the rise is. Okay. Um, we know what the fossil fuel plot looks like long term because it's a finite resource. The area under the curve is not something we can, we don't have the freedom to draw this any way we want. We know that it's a pulse. We know that it's momentary. So we know it goes back to zero and a zero for forever, essentially, um, as far as we're concerned. And when you recognize that what came before this spike was our energy came from mussels and firewood, animals, slaves, um, ourselves. Um, what's going to come after? There's a certain symmetry and at least begs the question. Right, we and, and the fairest thing I can say is we just don't know, but it's worth realizing that we don't know. That's important. We can say some things that aren't going to be happening. It's not going to be fossil fuels at today's level. It's not going to be growth. It's not going to be a growth-based world. Big changes are in store. My default assumption when I came in, when I first started thinking about plots like this, is that yeah, sure, but we'll sort of settle out. We'll level out somewhere with solar and wind and whatever, geothermal, nuclear, uh, fusion, whatever it takes. We'll, we'll uh, use technology and, and it doesn't matter that the fossil fuels go away. So I'll talk a little bit about that. But first, just a little bit of an exploration. If we expand our energy at a few percent per year, which is historically what we've done for you know past few centuries, uh, it turns out that 2.3% per year uh, translates to a factor of 10 every century. So I, I always gravitate to that because it's very convenient mathematically. And so at a factor of 10 every century, 18 terawatts today, that's our power today, would reach the total solar power reach hitting the Earth, Earth's land in 300 some years. And then all the sun hitting the upper atmosphere of the Earth in 400 years, and then the power output of the sun, the entire sun, surrounding the entire sun, 1400 years. And here's an example where the math is easy. We have 10 to the 11 or 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So 10 to the 11 is 11 orders of magnitude. Each order of magnitude is 100 years. So that's 1100 years more. And so we're at the entire Milky Way galaxy in 2500 years. Uh, this is something Tim Grice first pointed out to me, and I thought, wow, that's, uh, it's true if we continue this exponential uh, and scary. And I'll point out that it takes light 100,000 years to cross the Milky Way, so there's no way this happens. Physics says no, right? Just can't do it. This won't happen. You can also play a thermodynamic game using just the Stefan Boltzmann law for infrared radiation leaving the planet. And if you did continue this, power climb, nothing happens really for a little while, but eventually we hit body temperature, we boil water in about 400 years, uh, paper is burning in 500 years, and we melt steel, and then we're sun surface temperature inside of 1000 years, if we're requiring this uh, energy growth on Earth. So what this says is it's absurd. Of course we can't do anything like that. Um, and on a time scale of centuries, we run into severe Trouble. And to put it in perspective, 18 terawatts, our industrial society's output, um, over the land computes to about 0.1 watts per square meter. That's about uh, an order of magnitude lower than the radiative forcing from CO2, from the excess CO2 from climate change. So right now, climate change is a bigger issue than the waste heat. But if you continue to factor of 10 per century, you know, in a century, they're comparable and Waste heat's 10 times larger, 200 years. Um, so it's independent of what physics you use. I mean, fusion or some, you know, un, as yet unnamed physics, it's, it's gonna be thermodynamic in nature. Okay, so what does this mean for economics? It means that since physical scales can't continue to grow on a finite planet, it's just ludicrous, um, you can't continue economic growth either. Because as you run through time, 
both are growing, but the physical scale saturates and it can't grow anymore. This is the best case, it could also go down. In order to keep your economy growing, this is the log scale. So in order to keep it growing, um, that means that these physical resources have to become arbitrarily cheap relative to your economic scale, which if you think about it, doesn't make any sense because a finite resource that's essential is never going to be like one penny out of your annual salary. Uh, supply demand will, will see to that. So basically, any saturation in the physical scale is a break on the economic scale. Uh, so that can't continue. Okay, now limits to growth, not a new idea. Um, in the 1970s, uh, 1972, a group at MIT, um, I'm not sure why this thing is up here. Let me see if I can kill it. Oh, that's not what I expected. Let me try again more accurately. Nope. All right, we live with it. So um, 1972, a computer model at a uh, group of MIT researchers uh, found that when they modeled a lot of parameters in the world, they saw a collapse kind of around now, uh, 50 years into their future. And they said, oh, that's not good. Uh, let's, maybe we did something wrong. Let's double the resources. Let's have, you know, more technology. Let's have pollution controls. Let's have, they kept adding things to their model to try to tame this very stubborn tendency to collapse sometime in this century. So here's one where they doubled the resources and you still collapse for different reasons. In this case, it's pollution that gets you, which we might think of as CO2. Um, and, and so they identified a, a common cause, a dynamical reason for this, which makes a lot of sense. Any delay in the negative feedback leads to overshoot because you don't get the information soon enough to stabilize. And that's just a generic phenomenon in a system. And we've got a lot of delays in our negative feedbacks uh, in the decades time scale. I mean, human lifetimes are many decades in that is one uh, delay phenomenon right there. So the most recent comparisons of actual data, how's the world going compared to these models is that I think this uh, business as usual too is the one that's most similar to what we're doing um, uh, up to now. The, they were able to produce some sustainable runs that stabilize population and agriculture and and pollution and so forth, industrial output. Um, we are, they had to start, by the way, in 1974. They said, to do this, you have to start now. We didn't, surprise. Um, and so those are completely ruled out. We're not on those trajectories. Okay, so let me share a gallery of hockey stick curves. So hockey stick curves are flat for a while and then they surge in great you know, exuberance. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so population is a, such a hockey stick. It's up to 8 billion now, and it's shot up very rapidly. All these plots will have the same time axis. So this is global energy use, and that's also a giant hockey stick in all forms. Mostly it's fossil fuels. But even per capita, it's not just that all these things are tied straight to population. So once you have population looking like a hockey stick, all these others do too. A lot of these things are hockey sticks even per capita which is like scary square. This is a uh, gross world product. So the gross domestic product of the world, tremendous hockey stick. And then we have per capita also does the same thing. Doesn't surprise us because we have a much higher standard of living now than hundred years ago, for instance. This is a uh, copper production as a proxy for metals and extraction. Um, so, it's a, it's a hockey stick, and I'm not going to keep plotting per capita, but it's a per capita hockey stick as well. This is CO2. It's why a lot of us need, even know about hockey stick curves. It's shot up because of fossil fuels. And we have plastic, discarded plastic. So plastic that goes to the landfills as, again, a proxy for just waste. So it's a big hockey stick. <clears throat> and now we get to some ecology here, extinctions. Those are also rocking up. The background, the baseline is 0.1 extinctions per million species per year. And so 100 is a thousand times the background and we're above 100 uh, now in um, 
birds and mammals and amphibians almost almost uh, 10,000 times, 6,000 times. So that's not great. There are other not great things, which is if you look at forest cover, um, there's an earlier data point on here, by the way, but if you look at a few points in forest cover, it's declining rapidly, but more serious is the uh, primeval forest. The original forest is down to a very small fraction of what it was. And wild mammal mass on land, land mammal mass, looks like this. We're now down to 20% of the pre-modern mammal mass, wild mammal mass. And so most of that in the last century, and I don't know about you, but I think if we can knock out 80%, the last 20% is going to be a piece of cake. We've got this. We're so good at it. Um, so that's pretty troubling. And if you look in the, at the mammals uh, right now, we are, humans are 36% of the mammal mass on the planet. And our domesticated animals, another 60%. Together, 96%, leaving 4% in wild form broken out here for land mammals and ocean mammals and little uh, blow-ups. Also a, a survey of 30,000 vertebrate populations. This is not small number of statistics. 30,000 vertebrate populations, so more than just mammals around the planet, um, shows an average decline of about 70% in numbers since 1970. So I was born in 1970. Uh, that doesn't seem good. If we look at cumulative ex extinctions um, of various, uh, various domains in the animal kingdom, we've got, um, you know, two-ish percent uh, now extinct and climbing fast. Okay, so this is why we can't have nice things. This is something Dan Arovis told to me once, funny guy, Dan, um, when I did something as vice chair that backfired, some well-intentioned thing, and it blew up, and he said, well, this is why we can't have nice things. And um, part of this is that these groups, Global Footprint Network um, and Earth Overshoot Day, have put together um, analysis of how many Earths we need at various standards of living. So if we all live like we do in the US, we'd need five Earths to sustain that. Global average is 1.75, already over. Okay, so I will say, and the authors of this will also admit that this is an optimistic estimate in that they haven't taken account of the non-renewable resources that we're using to even do this. So, aquifers that we're depleting, fossil fuels are propping up all these activities. They're just looking at how much land, what's the land impact and the, the derivative and how we could uh, pull the derivative to zero, but that's subsidized heavily by these other non-renewable resources. Okay, so let's talk about time. How am I doing on time? Okay, um, so, the universe itself, about 14 billion years old. Humans in some form have been on the planet for two and a half, three million years. And that's about a 5,000th of the age of the universe, so 20 seconds out of a day to get some scale. And if we put this in context of something we can understand, so the two and a half, three million years that we've had on this planet, we compare it to a human lifetime. That's something we can comprehend. So Homo sapiens, our own species, has only been around the last five years. Civilization, everything that we call civilization, from agriculture to cities, is only 10,000 years old. That's 15 weeks out of a human lifetime. That's a recent hobby. It's a whole new thing that we've never tried before, and now here we are. It's very new. Science we've done for only the last four days of this lifetime. So I think of civilization and agriculture as uh, about control, controlling your environment, controlling your food, controlling pests, controlling the world. And science really ramped up that control. It gave us amazing tools for manipulation and control of our environment. So it, it really amped it up. And then we got fossil fuels, met even more recently. And now we had the power to do those things with incredible efficacy. 
And most of the ecosystem harm has just been in the last 12 hours of this lifetime. It's happening really fast. I like to think of civilization as kind of like a gateway drive. It's something your old uncle just picked up 15 weeks ago. Now he hangs around different people. Um, he, his behavior is different, his attitude is different, just a whole different person, uh, hardly recognizable. Four days ago, started cocaine. Really like amp that thing up. And then PCP, superpowers, in the last you know, few days, day and a half. And you know where that leads. Thanks. Yeah, in, in intensive care unit. So, you know, all this speed, what's the rest? There are billions of years of time left, but we're acting like there's no tomorrow and self fulfilling prophecy in a way. Okay. So, these are two sides of the same coin, though. These things that go up, these celebrated metrics of human activity, gross world product, yay. Um, it's, it signals positive feedback in exponential growth expansionary expansionary in, in nature and it's optimized by the combination of capitalism and democracy that really allows you to go the fastest possible that's a great combination but i don't want to pick on those because all modern systems speak seek growth and they're all you know whether you're talking about communism or socialism they're all ecologically blind okay that that's not their priority they're not founded on principles of ecological sustainability. They just really aren't. Um, so this comes at the expense of ecosystems through a long list of things. And most of the damage, as I've said, is just in the most recent period. Um, and it's, it's sort of, a lot of these things are interconnected. The, Habitat loss and deforestation has fragmented uh, habitats so that as we turn on climate change, those animals are locked in. They can't just naturally migrate because they're, they're closed off. And it turns out animals have no pockets. I figured this out. That's why they don't have money. And so they can't vote. They can't stop the bulldozer. They have no voice. You know, they're, they're powerless against our economic machine. So I kind of think of Modernity is a menace to life, not just other life, but ours in the end too, which I'll try to elucidate in a bit. So what are the fates of these hockey sticks? What can happen? So um, can they just keep going up? No, because planetary limits. You can't just grow forever. That doesn't work. They could return to zero. In fact, the non-renewables have to do this. Fossil fuels have to do this. Mind things have to do this at some point. Human population, you should understand, is largely subsidized by fossil fuels, by fertilizer and the mechanisms by which we, uh, you know, it's a very fossil fuel intensive enterprise. We wouldn't have 8 billion people without fossil fuels, just, just very clear. Um, things could also level out. That's a possibility. That's a mode. You can have mixtures of this mode. You just can't have the one on the left. So renewables could do this. They could level out if they're not dependent on non-renewable resources, which renewable energy technologies are, are dependent on non-renewable resources. And you also have to satisfy the requirement that the ecosystem can cope with that level. You can't just dial it to any arbitrary level and say, I want to level out here. It might be beyond what the ecosystem can, can accommodate. So is renewable energy the answer? Um, Ask the question, what is it that renewable energy is trying to do? A lot of people would say it's trying to combat climate change. These are carbon friendly, you know, no carbon dioxide or very little carbon dioxide uh, technologies. Um, what goes unsaid, but it's a, it really goes without saying, is that what we're trying to do is keep civilization fully powered uninterrupted. And we don't even question that. It's not saving the planet, it's saving our way of life. We don't even, I mean, that. of course we do that. Um, so I, I want us to question that as well. So the other thing is that the material demands per energy unit go up about an order of magnitude from coal, gas, compared to say hydro, solar, and wind, 
because these are very diffuse energy sources that require a lot of stuff to harness, um, a lot of materials. So the copper alone in solar, if we were to replace our fossil fuel, 15 terawatts of fossil fuels with solar, that would require us to increase our copper production on the planet by 10 times. Can we do it even? I mean, we're kind of spraying at the current level. And one way to see that is if you look at the ore grade of copper over time in the US and the world has a similar trend, you know, early on we we're finding some really nifty spots with high concentration copper. Of course, we're going to go to those first and get the low-hanging fruit. We found those all. I mean, believe me, we, we've explored this planet. We know where they are, and we're not finding those things anymore. Um, I will say also that copper extraction, for every kilogram of copper that you get, I mean, you can read it right off here, you have 200 kilograms of waste material, and a lot of that has toxins and pollutants that get into uh, our water system and, and hurt animals and ecosystems. So why would we want to ramp that up by factor of 10? Okay, if you ask the animals, you know, wild mammals, what do you want? Should we, you want us to succeed in our renewable energy transition um, so that we can keep our civilization fully powered? Of course not. Of course that's bad for them. They see it, they know. Uh, what have we used our energy to do? We've used all this energy to expand the human enterprise. We've cleared land and forests, we've mined materials, we've crippled the ecosystems. You've seen the, the, the plots of what's happened. So our intent here matters. And I really like this analogy that um, Dennis Meadows from the Limits to Growth uh, originally had, which is that if a man is coming at you with a hammer, intent on doing you harm, very clear, the intent is to do you harm. You don't care anymore whether it's a hammer or a knife or a gun or a mace or a microphone. The problem is the intent to do you harm. That's the core problem. So what is our intent in using energy? What do we want this energy for? Are we gonna use it for ecological restoration? Or are we gonna use it to continue extracting, expanding, exploiting for money, at the expense of ecosystem health. Where are our priorities? And you might say, well, good thing we've locked in the vote, uh, but it's not just the mammals. This is the biomass of the entire planet. Animals are a small corner. And within that, humans are about 3% of all animals and 0.01% of all life by mass. So if you had one kilogram, one vote, you know, we're out of the picture. Um, and this has co-evolved to be a very complex system. Um, and it's like an organism. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of parts in our body that do different functions that maybe we don't even understand completely. And just because I don't understand what my pancreas does doesn't mean it's a good idea to rip it out and stomp on it. Um, so, Elements of our ecosystems are doing things that evolve to do, you know, operate on multi-level um, uh, functionalities. And so we can die by organ failure. So let's not mess with stuff we don't understand. Um, our survival, I would say, depend, depends on defeating uh, what I call a human supremacist attitude that we don't need ecosystems and can thrive on our ingenuity somehow. We absolutely need ecosystems. That's our context. We, we didn't sort of pop onto this planet just sort of fully formed separate beings. Um, we evolved in an evolutionary context as part of complex ecosystems. Okay, so our perspectives are distorted. We have a lot of faith in innovation and technology. To me, it's scary how much faith we have and those things, and I understand it. I mean, we have a track record that's pretty impressive uh, and we're not done, there will be new ideas, that, that's sure. But realize that the current level of faith is based on this. 
you have only lived in this upward sweep of this curve. The oldest person in this room, when they were a kid, the oldest person they knew has only lived on this upward swing. So you can understand why the attitudes that come from that distorted moment in time would just penetrate everything we think about ourselves. Okay, so um, it's like a one-time inheritance that we're spending just a few days in this lifetime analogy. And it's not a good predictor of the future. Kind of everything you know about how the world works is largely based on this really strange period where we had this inherent spinning. And it's kind of like a fireworks show, dazzling the fireworks show. It's, um, it's impressive, it's fun to watch. Um, but if you were born in this fireworks show, I wouldn't trust you to tell me what the sky conditions are gonna be like for the next 24 hours. If this is all you've ever seen of the sky, you don't even know what daylight is. I mean, like it's a really narrow frame of reference and it's a very unusual time. So we need a better perspective. I invite you to step back, think about these things from a broader point of view. And let's look at it this way. Our civilization is something like 10,000 years old when agriculture started, settlements, cities, conquerors. So which of the things that we do today could last for 10,000 10, or tens of thousands of years? Fossil fuels, absolutely not. I mean, hundreds of years. 10 billion humans? Well, right now that's just a reflection of fossil fuels, so pro probably not. Can you keep growth going? Well, even a factor of two, like let's say you're kind of ecological limits, you probably can't even tolerate a factor of two. And a factor of two in 10,000 years is such a tiny rate, we don't, I mean, it's, it's not a growth-based system. Can you do even mining? At today's scales, we've we've taken out you know a large fraction of the low hanging fruit, all of the low hanging fruit, in fact, in just a few hundred years. So what's ten thousand years? How does that work? <laughs> like, show me. <laughs> um, recycling? Maybe you could. You don't have to mine if you recycle. But even if you could achieve ninety percent recovery rate you're down to 10% of the resource after only 22 cycles, which might just be a few hundred years. So getting out to 10,000 years, how? Tell me. Um, nation states, globalization, advanced technology, anybody's guess who knows, but probably not. Probably not, because it's a heavy burden of proof to say that these things that are present in this very unusual period are a constant of life on this planet. That's a, that's a pretty bold statement to say that this could continue in the face of things that we can calculate and see we're on a finite planet. So don't let mythologies cloud our judgment. And you might think, what do you mean mythologies? Um, you know, are we talking about Zeus and Thor and that kind of thing? So we actually have a lot of mythologies in our civilization. And you might not really be aware of it, but the first mythology is modern humans are free of mythology. Step one, once you believe that, you know, you're golden. But we might say that humans are the pinnacle of evolution. Some people just don't, maybe haven't really thought about it critically, but we just say that. Maybe even the purpose, that's what evolution was for, it got to us. Um, the earth maybe is meant for humans. We can use it any way we want. It's ours. We own it. Humans are apart from nature. We have transcended the animal kingdom. We are a new thing. Not even biologically anymore. We're, we're maybe chosen for some people. Um, humans have some destiny. We're in, there is a purpose to our civilization. There is a purpose to our uh, path. Some, for some people, maybe it's a divine purpose. Maybe purpose is to master the planet um, or conquer the stars. And I'll pause to say that 
a sense of destiny is important to us as humans. We look for meaning in our lives. And if you deprive somebody of a sense of destiny, they might lose meaning. You know, maybe even some of you are thinking, well, gosh, if all this is true, what am I doing? Right? It's, it's, it's important. It, I think it's, it's worth understanding how important a sense of destiny can be in guiding our life choices, um, fitting into something we think is a bigger, uh, a bigger scheme. Maybe a lot of people think a human life is more than that of any other animal. So mythology, by the way, is something that has no evidence. It's an assertion. It's something you believe or want to believe. It's an unquestioned belief. Uh, humans are born with inalienable rights. Says who? Where's the evidence? Um, humans have the biggest brains, but no, they're whales. Okay, but biggest brain to body ratio, maybe, but then they're birds and shrews. And, but we'll move the goalposts until we're, we're the best. Um, technology development only accelerates. That's a common mythology. And human ingenuity will always be there to save us. And I think that's common enough. I mean, I could sort of blast any of these things, but let me spend time on the last one. And I like to play this game of taking somebody from 1900, dropping them suddenly in 1960 with no travel guide, and then taking somebody from 1960, dropping them in 2020. Each has taken a 60 year jump, let's say pre pandemic 2020. Um, okay, so each has a 60 year jump. Which step is more bewildering? Which one is more confused about the world they see themselves in, they find themselves in? And by experience, talking to people, pulling students, it's about a two to one ratio that people think that the last step is going to be more bewildering. And it's fascinating to me that that is what most people think. It tells me something about the mythology, tells me something about the narrative that whispered in our ear over all these years, uh, this sense that we're just on this uh, accelerating tear. But the early jumper, would never have seen airplanes, helicopters, rockets, satellites, photovoltaics, nuclear power, movies, radio, television, transistors, electronics, plastic, and credit cards, refrigerators, washing machines, all these appliances. The world would be very baffling. Whereas the late jumper would see a lot of refinements and be pretty impressed with, for instance, our displays and miniaturization, but they're not gonna say, how did those people get inside the box? Um, they're not going to, you know, they see you talking in this stupid looking rectangle, they're going to know it's a phone and they're going to know that if it doesn't have a cord, it's radio, it's not magic. So think about that and what it means for our narrative that we're just always improving fast, rapid, ever more rapid. Not really true. Let me talk about equalities and inequalities. So kind of physics style. Unsustainable is another word for failure. If you don't manage to sustain, then your enterprise has failed. Uh, sustainable then is kind of synonymous with success. If you want to be long-term successful, that requires being sustainable. Our civilization is not at all sustainable. It's not even close. Um, it wasn't founded on principles of sustainability. It never asked what nature could tolerate. It just went and did stuff. Nobody was deciding to do it. It's just sort of um, how it, it un unraveled. That means that civilization is failure. What we know is civilization is a failure mode. Now, the most important thing I think I'll say in this whole talk is this, and I want it to really sink in and think about it. Humans are not civilization. A lot of people think, well, if civilization fails, humanity fail. No, not at all. We often see that conflation, but humans are not civilization. It's not baked in. It's not in our DNA. We're a lot older than this recent hobby. And this is a blind spot I didn't point out, but all these mythologies, the, the common blind spot was humans, how we think of ourselves. We're really bad at that. Okay, we're not very objective here. So we're bad about it here too, because we are not civilization. Now, hunter-gatherers 
were a lot more sustainable, lasted for millions of years in, in a sense as humans, uh, at least 100,000 100, years as homo sapiens mm -hmm. and beyond. So that's pretty close to success. But again, I'll say that humans are not equal to hunter-gatherers. That is another mode that we've tried, but that's not either baked in. So meaning and fulfillment and laughter are part of what it is to be human. That doesn't mean that comes from civilization. There are other ways to have meaning, fulfillment, and laughter. Okay, so what we need is a new operating system. So the hardware that we're running is the same for 30,000 years. Um, there's actually evidence that we have smaller brain sizes than the pre-agricultural humans because you know, the way I think about it is, is uh, a hunter-gatherer had to understand their ecological environment very well in cycles and cycles and... Uh, behaviors and plants and you know once your job is to schlep water up the hill you know how much brain power do you need but anyway let's just set that aside we have the same hardware for eons the first operating system is based on wisdom founded on wisdom homo sapiens sapiens ran for many tens of thousands of years we call it hunter gatherer and i'm really impressed the more i learn about it some of their philosophies are very deep and uh, you can connect the dots for how those philosophies uh, result in a robust, sort of stable and sustainable uh, living, very biophysically rooted, very ecologically minded. Okay, our operating system, based on agriculture, founded on agriculture, just 10,000 years old, and we're redlining the machine, all these hockey sticks, it's bad news, we're not doing so well. Uh, it tries to expand, self promotes humans above all else, uh, isolates from other, uh, from, from nature, discounts the future. And I'll warn you that if you put little value on the future, you might just get a future with little value. So there's a self fulfilling element to that. And these are fundamental design flaws in our operating system. They were just bad news to start. But again, these flaws are not intrinsic to humans. It's not baked in. It's in our culture, in our operating system, not who we fundamentally are. So the core engine behind these value modes, I would say, is human supremacy. The idea that we can master nature, control it, transcend it, own it, put ourselves above. That's where all the trouble starts. So we need a new operating system founded now in humility. And maybe it's the next great adventure in humanity. Okay, maybe this is really exciting. I think it would be largely unrecognizable to either of the previous two. To our minds, we wouldn't be able to decide whether it's primitive or advanced. It just sort of defies our, our schema. Maybe it uh, adapts a lot of the wisdom from the first operating system and a lot of the knowledge from the second one. And so it's not like a wipeout. It's not a reversion. We're not going to go back. We can't just go back. That's not the way things work. Um, and so it's going to be some melding, but built for long-term sustainable biophysical uh, existence on uh, you know more meaning about being part of nature reciprocity and kinship to nature, and humility, not the masters or overlords or gods of the planet, not trying to understand everything and control everything, because we're never going to solve it all. We're just, that's, that's hubris, that's not possible. And so humility is a much more uh, appropriate response. So what goes through my head? How do I look at the future? What helps me think about the far future? An image like this helps me. I'm not saying this is what the future is. I'm just saying this kind of image helps me. To think of something that's unobtrusive, blends into nature, allows wildness. It's neither advanced nor primitive. It looks sustainable, renewable. Um, 
it's pleasant. I wouldn't mind living there. Um, another image is something like this that kids are born without an operating system, not pre installed. Our culture installs it pretty rapidly, but we get new starts. The, the kid born in 100 years will accept the world that they find themselves in as normal. They don't care that they don't have an iPhone. What, what, what does it matter to them? It's not a thing. So they will find meaning and laughter. Kids will play. Guarantee you. And the other thing I don't have an image for, I, I tasked a friend who's been working a lot with AI to develop really interesting art. And it turns out if you want a cross between an owl and a crocodile in this sort of style of, you know, name your artist, you're in luck. It can do that. And it's really impressive. But if you ask it for a specific kind of image with conveying a kind of meaning, it's hopeless. It can't do it. Some really hilarious fails along the way, but I don't have an image to show you. Uh, but the, the thought is picture people of the future walking maybe along a forest path and they're chatting and they're laughing and they're uh, teasing each other. And one person finds a snail, puts it on the backside of the person in front. There it is crawling up. And everybody behind is giggling and laughing because it's funny. It's just funny. And then the person finds it and says, oh, you're not laughing at what I was saying. You're laughing at Okay, that is really funny. The, the point is that that's what it is to be human, right? That's who we are. That, I can guarantee you, is the future. So there are a lot of things I know will be part of the future. Um, and laughter is one of them. And it's not misery. It's meaning in other ways. So a lot of people here in this kind of message want to know, what can I do? What should we do? Um, and I'm not going to give you a feel good set of recipes, a surprise. Um, because I don't think those are, are very effective. I mean, yeah, I do a lot of things that are, you know, I think helping and going in the right direction. But what I'd really like folks to do if they want is learn more about this. Think about it. Reflect on it, talk with others, explore this domain. Don't get trapped in our current cultural systems and our mythologies, try to break free. You might traverse various stages of grief. That's okay. You'll laugh in the end. I still laugh, I have fun. Uh, be gentle with yourself and others in this process. Um, so that's one thing. Reject easy sounding solutions that just are too good to be true. Recipes, algorithms. We do this, this, and this, we're okay. Especially if they're based on technology, hubris, um, and don't address the root causes, the things that are causing all the biophysical, ecological harm. Uh, so solar panels aren't clearly addressing the root problem. So learn to spot, identify, and distance yourself from human supremacy. This idea that we've got this, we're gonna control everything. That's a bad recipe. Prioritize biodiversity and ecosystem health, because if we don't have that, we don't have anything. That has to be the foundation. Think about it as asking permission of nature for the things that we do, being good neighbors, being humble, participants in the community of life, not its overlords. And think about modernity. The thing that we're in now is something that definitely can't go forever, but neither can a human life. And often when a human life is near its end, we call hospice and we have look for a dignified exit. Well, let's look for a dignified exit for modernity. It's brought us some nice things. Let's identify what we should carry with us into the future and jettison the rest. So I also invite you to engage in the task of imagining what can come next, because we need our inventive um, capabilities to come up with a better way to live on this planet. 
but it has to be predicated on long-term biophysical sustainability. Other, everything else is a failure. So that has to be what we start with first. And also ask yourself what we're missing in this world. What have we lost? Um, the fact that a lot of people when they go on vacation go find nature, that's somewhat revealing, isn't it? Um, how can we celebrate being human and part of this community of life? So we're better than what we're doing right now. We are not modernity. We are. We can be better than that. It's something we got trapped into. And so let's find a way slowly. It's not overnight. Might not be in our lifetimes, but let's start. I like this analogy that um, we see the water rising. We're going to have to learn to swim, but it's only to our ankles now. So we can't start swimming right now because we look like a fool floundering around in mud. So, but we need to at least understand swimming is coming. We need to prepare for a graceful transition. So I'm gonna go very quickly through this. My own response, I've reduced a lot of my footprint for a number of reasons, but that's not the total answer. I also wrote a textbook um, that, just a couple of years ago that you can get for free uh, as a PDF. And I co-initiated recently this thing called the Planetary Limits Academic Network, which has a lot of well-aligned thinkers from all disciplines. Um, and, you know, we've got something like 100 members right now, mostly the U.S. and Europe, uh, and we're, we're planning some, some expansion there. And I'm, I'm engaged increasingly in efforts to promote critical thought in this space. I think it's very important. And I'm leaving astrophysics research. I mean, that's part of my response. I, I had fun doing it, but at some level, it's now a distraction and it lacks meaning from, for me. So I'm retiring, it's my last year at UCSD, and I'm going to go do things that I think are important. Um, so I will leave you with this. I'm not going to go through it. You can look at some of these success or failure modes and, and elements of those that are kind of dual. And, uh, and apologize a little bit. This is a lot. It's a heavy dump for one exposure. This is decades of my own um, experience. And it might be somewhat alien and unintelligible, in fact. I, I recognize um, all at once like this. But let it sink in. And, uh, and reflect on these things as we go. Okay. I don't know if it's on. Thank you, Tom. So any questions? Graduate students first. Any questions for the graduate students? Light is told you there's no hub. I, I have a question. Uh, hello? Hello? Oh, man, I'm, I'm going cold turkey. That's, uh, it's hard, but... <laughs> okay. Anyone with questions? Hello? So, on the long term, which is very difficult to tell what's going on, you will make it right. But on the short term, I remember when I came to this country in 1970, we were told that there would be no fossil fuel in 25 years. But it's 25 years later, we did that. I remember a talk by you, actually, 10 years ago, that was talked about peak energy and that that was very good. So, on the short range, it seems like many of these doomsday scenarios fail. And therefore, I wonder whether these long-range scenarios are. Well, if the lesson that things haven't failed, so the question is a lot of short-term predictions uh, fail of doom, and so why should we trust any of them? Um, when it's something like a finite resource, you can't say the fact that it didn't happen one decade when they said means that it's infinite. That's a pretty crazy leap. Uh, it's still a finite resource. And so you're guaranteed it will peak. On the subject of peak oil, um, the highest oil level that we produced is November, 2018. Okay, that's before the pandemic. 
Is it the highest ever? I don't know. I'm not going to say yes. It could, it's bumping around a plateau. It could easily spike up above that. It could climb slowly above that. I don't know. But to say that because the sky didn't fall yesterday mean it never will, means it never will. I'm not comfortable with the risk in, inherent in that kind of view. Okay. Brian, do you want to ask a question? You can unmute yourself. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, Tom, I'm on my way to the bar now. Uh, oh, thanks very much. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, uh, I, I have a different direction. I, I get into a lot of arguments on YouTube with people that claim that we're being visited by <clears throat> extraterrestrial craft. And these are craft not too dissimilar from, you know, what we fly around in in metal tubes. And maybe they look different. Maybe they can move a lot faster. But... They're made of material. They travel. They obey kin kinematic, you know, behaviors. I'm wondering. This is totally out of left field, but is it possible, based on the modest assumption that any other alien technology would have to have the same limitations on their own planet, namely diminishing returns, hockey sticks, energy limitations, even in a Dyson sphere context? Can we use that in any way? Can I use that to you know, um, to to portray the fact of the highly unlikely nature of being visited by material craft from another civilization. I realize it's totally out of the field, but all these uh, graphs, the hockey stick, the product of hot two hockey sticks um, and so forth would seem to put limits on the extraction of energy and the application to resources used to travel inter interstellar uh, wise. Anyway. Right. Okay. So I will absolutely repeat, maybe not every word. So Brian, nobody else in the place could hear you, but me. Um, so the question's from Brian Keating and it's um, to the effect that the, 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 lim the limits to resources that we experience on this planet could well be a common phenomenon under other planets because they're also finite, right? Um, and so can we put any constraints on or understand the fact that we've never been visited materially by or had communications with even other uh, aliens, uh, is this a, a way to understand maybe the universality of, of this? And I would say that's a very strong possibility. I, I kind of feel that, you know, it might even be that fossil fuels are common on other planets as locked up biophysical, you know, resources. And, um, and, the first species to evolve the smarts to access the fossil fuels, almost by the way evolution works, will not be wise enough not to do it. And so we'll all fall into the same trap and uh, potentially, um, you know, have maybe a spacefaring period locally on their back door, uh, backyard like we have, but that it's not a long term situation. So I think, I think, sure, that's a very interesting angle that might well be right. Yeah. So we have like a more specific pause style at like the uh, population of, of the energy consumption countries that uh, have like a static population and a big certain level of like uh, good life kind of Scandinavian countries and like super wealthy. Uh, like, do we have any thoughts on those that like role models that have like, yeah, so the question is, I showed a lot of exponential plots, <clears throat> uh, hockey sticks, and and what about areas, countries, regions that have slowed population growth or stopped it or even small declines, and what do those look like? So for one thing, I will say that the extrapolations I did um, are ludicrous in all kinds of ways, and that's one of them, that you know we're not going to keep going on population. There's just... That's not in the cards, but that's kind of the whole point of those exercises is just to say that growth is not possible to continue. Now, stabilizing, can we stabilize? So I think one thing I would say about that is, you know, the places that have stabilized have a high standard of living that require four or five Earths. 
So if the globe stabilized by a similar path, we would need four or five Earths. So it's unlikely, I think, given that the ecological trends are still in rapid decline, and I would say that those countries that have stabilized are absolutely contributing to that decline, maybe not in their own countries because there's a global economy and so it might be happening somewhere else, um, but that I don't see any evidence that the, the globe could support a stabilized population, even at today's levels, even if we, we took on the average global citizen's uh, standard of living, uh, that seems to be out of the, you know, out of the cards. So as someone who does science and uh, um, I, uh, I guess definitely, um, I would say you're enjoying Oh, sure. I remember doing a series from the Boston, let's see the future to kind of look about um, the world getting better. Um, but that's not what I want to ask you about, but you're saying that the um, almost the first of present in the past because of, you know, we have standards of living, we have the freedom of living, we have a lot of um, ideas. Um, is there something, um, yeah, is there something that, um, I mean, I know this doesn't like contradict your worldview, but do you have any sorrow for a future where so we don't have the access to technology to have a lot of um, um, you know, um, having a lot of these skills be useful for the one things like electricity or um, sophisticated um, equipment? Or, yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess the question is. Um, there are a lot of good things in this world right now that we enjoy, no doubt. And I enjoy a lot of those things too. I'm a product of modernity, just like everybody in this room. Um, and so sure, there are gonna be things that, that we miss. Whenever you move away from a city, you miss certain restaurants that were in the old city. You just do, and you can't ever replace it. Um, now I do have this slide, it's not exactly what you're talking about, about you know being careful not to cherry pick, that we can point to a lot of apparent benefits our system is broad, but they've been almost exclusively in the human domain in the short term and at the expense of ecosystem health. So we have to accept that there are two sides of the coin and we can't just shave off the front side of the coin and say, I wanna keep that stuff. So it becomes a more complicated answer in that, do I appreciate these things? I have to also ask at what cost? And in balance, do I still prefer the thing that I enjoy if I know that it causes net harm? So it's complicated. But yeah, I mean, personally, of course, I, I lament some of the things that, that I think we'll lose. Really think that I will have a lot of work. Um, from my relation to the Hadley Law School. Uh, that said, uh, I have a question regarding uh, when earlier you mentioned that sustainability is um, not there without organization, right? And then, um, when you also said for future, it's possible if the movement changes. Uh, you know, to sustain and that will be doctor, for example, and things like that. However, uh, if we consider our uh, non modern model right now, which is based on monetary returns, if we don't do it first, we don't get money. Yes. Right? So, and it's, I would love to do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Already, I am like hiking the monetary Very advanced for the generation I was How do we really we want to make sustain and we do see that, but we do need to sustain that. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the question is basically 
That's great that I'm retiring. Uh, <laughs> congratulations. What about young people who can't just do that? Because we, we do need to survive in this current system. And you're absolutely right. Uh, this is a lot like my comment about we can't swim yet. Um, the water's in, only ankle deep. And so I think what it means is that during a transition period, which could last our entire lifetimes, I don't have a great sense of the time scale for this. Um, I mean, I do somewhat guided by the limits to growth think I would be surprised if we hold it together through 2080, but that's still pretty far. Okay. Um, and I'm prepared to be surprised. Never underestimate this super organism that we're in to kick the can down the road and kind of keep the wheels kind of wobbling, but still on for a long time. So that might be your entire life. And it's still just kind of uh, um, still shambling along. So I, I would say that there will be some dissonance in that we, a lot of us will have to do things that we know aren't part of the long future. And, and it might lose some meaning. I, I don't know how to prevent that other than denial, which is anybody's welcome to, to use. It's pretty effective. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Okay, I mean, keep that in mind too. That this, oh, this crazy guy when, when, uh, when I was young gave this talk and wasn't that kind of a a trip, um, you know, that's possible. So, I guess you know it might not sound like much help, but do the best you can do for yourself and pay attention to the things that you think deserve your attention. Um. And maybe just start preparing psychologically for a world that could change. And part of what I want to do is prevent um, panic at some level that, oh, yeah, this is happening and it's too bad in some ways. But all right, we'll deal with it. We'll we'll adapt as it changes. Um, in the interest of time, we probably yeah. are. Okay. Let me take one more question. Thank you so much. Thanks. One more question. That's it. And we can, and we gotta go. We can continue the conversation, but I think a lot of folks have one. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, what an amazing, eloquent, um, stirring, and terrifying. <laughs> um, so clinging to my last shreds of meaning and purpose <laughs> in this uh, Aaron Porter. Um, I just want to ask you whether. I love the thing about not being able to swim yet because the water's only ankle deep. That mm -hmm. makes so much sense to me of everything that you've been doing. And it kind of really helps me understand the um, almost the nihilism of your perspective. Um, optimistic nihilism. Optimistic nihilism. I still believe we can. Yes, right. Yeah. So, uh, my question is about the energy transition, which you reject as a solution. and. So, as I say, clinging to my last words of meaning, um, is it possible that 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 the distributed nature of renewable energy, the fact that it is a not an energy dense solution, is in a sense exactly what we will have to do to um, start to learn what swimming is? In other words, it has such constraints on it, right. the kind of constraints that you are interested in, that. It's actually incompatible with the sort of growth of this sure. so distressing to both of us um, and to that whole mindset. But to actually embrace a kind of diversified energy transition based on all the possible things that are less harmful is how we learn how to swim, rather than just rejecting that outright yeah. and going for a kind of um, something profound as to happen to human nature. Or not to human nature, but to our whole kind of um, attitude towards how we live. Right. Yeah. So the question is because renewable energy sucks, won't it just get us to, you know, it's not capable of doing the same things that we are used to in fossil fuels? Absolutely true. And will that help us transition? I think that's a very astute point and idea. And, you know, just to emphasize that, 
we don't know how to do at scale concrete and steel and industrial processing with electricity. That's not how we make renewable energy technologies. We need the fossil fuels right now for so many things. We burn things to uh, uh, to create, you know, molten steel and, and so forth. So you can do it with tungsten arcs, but they're small. And so it's really, you know, it's hard. So yeah, I do think that we will be constrained and we will learn the hard way that renewables wow. aren't going to let us just keep fully powered. Yeah, that's right. They're, they're going to uh, come with sacrifices. Now, the real question is, when we collectively learn that, will we keep our institutions going to the point where we can be smooth about it and accept it? Or will, will things kind of get a little chaotic when we're trying to do one thing and not accepting the fact that we can't and, um, and fighting over the scraps of the fossil fuels? Um, so, and then the, the other question I have is, you know, maybe that would help a transition, but long-term, could we even support that kind of high level of technology to make a solar photovoltaic? I don't know. That's all in the context of a fossil fuel world. I don't know that we do this in a post-fossil fuel world. Nobody does, but I would be skeptical or at least I think there's reason to question, but yeah, I think the point is is relevant that it, it could provide something of a glide path. Yeah. Okay, let's thank Tom. Yeah, I know there were many, many other questions, so I don't know if you could stay a little while. And I'm I'm here, free. Uh, yeah. So inclined, you can stay and, and interrogate, or you can move on to PCD. Uh,